Welcome to our friends here in the United States, in Israel, and across the globe. Shalom to all. I'm Alan Jay, Director of Outreach and Engagement here at the Zionist Organization of America. On behalf of ZOA and our partner organizations, Yesha Council, My Israel, the Shiloh Foreign Policy, and Arut Sheva, I would like to welcome you to this, the third installment of our now four-part mega event series in support of Judea and Samaria. Today's presentation is entitled Paradigm Shift Towards a New Middle East. We're excited to announce that owing to popular demand, we're adding a fourth installment to the mega event series to be aired two weeks from today on Sunday, March 7th at the same time when we will speak to the challenges to Israeli defense in Judea and Samaria. All microphones except for those of our panelists will remain muted for the duration of the program. We have a tight schedule, but we will find time to field some questions at the end of the program. If you have a question for one of our panelists, please post it in either the Zoom Q&A or chat feature found in the middle bottom of your screen. Yishai Fleischer is the international spokesperson for the Jewish community of Hebron, the home of the biblical tomb of the matriarchs and patriarchs, and a political hotspot in the Middle East. Yishai is a prolific writer, podcaster, and television personality, appearing in Newsweek, JNS, The New York Times, Fox, Al Jazeera, CNN, the BBC, and more. Yishai fights for Israel's sovereign rights, he fights BDS, he fights historical appropriation, and he fights to strengthen the Jewish people's presence in Judea and Samaria. Perhaps the most important for us here at ZOA, we're honored and grateful that Yishai has been a friend of ZOA for many years. He always sets time, aside time to meet with us and our ZOA student leaders during our advocacy missions in Israel, providing unique professional and personal firsthand insights into real life in Judea and Samaria. And on that score, we at ZOA are hopeful, pandemic allowing, of running our 2021 mission, leadership mission to Israel, an advocacy trip like no other in August. So Yishai, with Hashem's help, we hope to see you soon. I'll post my email address in the chat for anyone who'd like more information about the trip. With that, I turn the program over to our MC for today. Yishai, thank you for all you are doing in general, for being a friend to ZOA, and for MCing this important program. Yishai. Alan, thank you so much uh, for that fabulous introduction. And thank you to ZOA for coming to Hebron and to all the places in Judea and Samaria. There's nothing like your, your tours, but especially your student tours are amazing. Now, good evening and shalom from Israel to everybody. Good morning to people in the United States and all over the rest of the world. Welcome to everybody who's joined us today for this third gathering of the Judea and Samaria virtual mega event. This conference is an initiative of the Yesha Council of ZOA of My Israel, Israel Sheli, the Shiloh Forum. It's broadcast here on Zoom, on Facebook, and on Arut Sheva Israel National News. Today, I have the privilege of being with you. As was said, my name is Ishai Fleischer. I'm the spokesman for the Jewish community of Hebron, the city of the forefathers and mothers. Now, last week, uh, together with hundreds of participants, we delved into the legal issues of the rights of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, not only in terms of history, and heritage, uh, but also those the, the definitions of those rights in international law. So we had Minister Omer Yankalovich, Chairman of the Yesha Council, David Al Khayani, Director of the ZOA Israel Operations, Danny Luz, ZOA Director General Mark Levinson, uh, MK Michal Kotler Wunsch, Professor Eugene Kantorovich, and Dr. Emmanuel Navon. So that was a great lineup. Now you can watch the previous two meetings on the Yesha Council YouTube channel. Uh, and links will appear in the chat and also with all of our partner organizations. And of course, you're invited to share and to teach together uh, and learn and to teach about these important things because so many arguments against this are based on lies. And when we're not informed, we just don't know how to answer them. I'm happy to tell you, as was just mentioned, that in light of the great success of the previous meetings and the huge demand, we're actually adding a fourth meeting that will deal with the strategic and security aspects related to Judea and Samaria and you can register for it on the conference website. But on to today. Today is the third session, and we wanna look at the dramatic change that has taken place over the past year. For years, we have been repeatedly told that peace between Israel and the Arab world cannot be established without resolving the issues of Judea and Samaria, the so-called settlements, 
or without establishing a Palestinian state on the Jewish biblical heartland, the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. However, uh, re the recent Abraham Accords, which were signed in just one year between Israel and four major Muslim countries, showed that there is another way. Indeed, it is now proven that it is possible to work towards a more cooperative Middle East without obliging Israel to give up its heritage, its security, and its resilience. The Abraham Accords have taught us that a new Middle East can only arrive if Israel is strong, strong in technology, security, economy, and especially in our belief in our rightful heritage to this land. There's also a close connection between the Abraham Accords uh, and the American, the US recognition of the Golan Heights, the relocation of the embassy to Jerusalem, and the very important statement by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on the legality of the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, the so-called Pompeo Doctrine. All of these have brought about a realization, at least some circles, of the misguided paradigms that we've been hearing for years. Today, we're gonna to look at these issues uh, from several aspects and we will have an amazing lineup for you. <laughs> we will host here uh, the speaker of the Knesset, MK Ariva Levine from the Likud, a confidant of Prime Minister Netanyahu and a partner in all the processes that have taken place here in recent years. We will hear from Ambassador Dani Dayan, uh, now a member of the New Hope Party, who will present the diplomatic political angle. Then, uh, Najat Al Said, an Emirati researcher and journalist, will share with us a much needed perspective directly from the Arab world. Then, uh, Dr. Mordechai Kedar, uh, a world renowned Orientalist on the changes in the Arab world as seen from here. We'll also hear from Asher Fredman, who heads an organization for economic cooperation between Israel and the United Emirates, United Arab Emirates, on economic aspects of this new alliance, and he's been pioneering that. And we will also have a little bit of fun. We will hear from Vered Ben Saadon, the owner of Tora, Tura Winery in the locality of Rechelim in Samaria. Uh, that's next to REL. She's already signed an export agreement for oil and wine and other products from Judea and Samaria uh, with a large commercial company shipping them to the United Arab Emirates that's already underway. So here we go. Uh, that's a lot of stuff. We're going to have a great time. So here we go. I am honored to open today's meeting of the Judea and Samaria virtual mega event with Knesset speaker, Knesset member Yariv Levine. Dear friends, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the important subject of Judah and Samaria. Judah and Samaria is the heartland of the Jewish people the place where important part of our history took place and an area of great importance for our security. Over the years, we have been attacked from all around the world because of our presence there, but we stood strong. People claimed that our presence in Judah and Samaria was an obstacle to peace. How can the presence of a nation on its father's land be an obstacle to peace? In the past year, we proved that we can have peace without giving up our presence in Judah and Samaria. Actually, it is only when we declared even more powerfully our sovereign rights to the area that peace came. Our presence in our historical homeland is not an obstacle to peace. It is the key to peace. Only when the world will understand that they cannot remove us from our homeland will they stop attacking us. I want to thank the Zionist Organization of America, the Yesha Council, My Israel, and the Shiloh Forum for organizing this important conference and hope that you are gaining here the necessary knowledge in order to defend our presence in Judah and Samaria in America. Stand up for the truth. Stand up for justice. Stand up for Israel. Stand up for Judah and Samaria. Okay, thank you to the Speaker of the Knesset, uh, Knesset member Yariv and lawyer uh, Yariv Levine for those important words. Now, this conference, unlike the previous two sessions, will be held in a slightly different manner. This week, instead of panels, which we had previously, we will be holding short TED-style lectures. Uh, in addition, at the end, we will devote special time 
with the lectures for questions and answers. You are welcome to send questions in already now uh, and during the lectures, and we will try, with no promises, we will try to answer them all. So our first lecture is Danny Dayan. Danny Dayan was the Consul General of Israel in New York City. Danny was also the former chairman of the Yesha Council, the Council of Judea and Samaria, and served as chief foreign envoy for the Yesha Council for many years. He is now running with, uh, for Knesset uh, for office with the New Hope Party. And I'm indeed very happy to invite the one and only Danny Dayan. Hello, I'm very glad to be here with you. Uh, an extraordinary event organized uh, uh, among others by the organizations that I cherish, the Yesha Council, which I headed for almost six years, and uh, the COA, the Zionist Organization of America, with which I have wonderful relations when I served as Consul General in New York. So let me start. Uh, you know, the archive never forgets and uh, never forgives. So let me start with hearing a few words from former Secretary of State, John Kelly. There will be no separate peace between Israel and the Arab world. I want to make that very clear to all of you. I've heard several prominent politicians in Israel sometimes saying, well, the Arab world's in a different place now. We just have to reach out to them and we can work some things with the Arab world and we'll deal with the Palestinians. No, 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 and no. I can tell you that reaffirmed even in the last week as I have talked to leaders of the Arab community. There will be no advanced and separate peace with the Arab world without the Palestinian process and Palestinian peace. Everybody needs to understand that. That is a hard reality. Well, that was uh, John Kerry, the Secretary of State, saying, I think, four or five times, no, 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 and no. At least uh, it reminded me of the three no's of Khartoum, no peace, no recognition, no negotiation with Israel, uh, with the same Khartoum in, in which we'll, we will soon have an Israeli embassy and uh, a blue and white flag with the Magenda V in its center um, on the top of the uh, masthead. So um, it is clear that uh, uh, not only that, uh, respect Secretary of State Kerry was completely wrong. As a matter of fact, uh, as a result of the Abraham Accords with the Emirates, with uh, uh, Bahrain, with Sudan, with Morocco, we can say now clearly, I think that uh, we were able to say it even before the Accords, but the, the Abraham Accords made it very clear the Israeli-Arab conflict is over. That conflict, that famous or infamous conflict with which all of us, uh, except for the very young, grew up knowing that is an axiom that Israel and the Arab states are at war, or at least they are in a conflict, that is not true anymore. There is no Israeli-Arab conflict anymore. Actually, it was reduced to a conflict between Israel and our immediate neighbors, the Palestinians. So if, if you want to uh, 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 even make it more clear, let's take a whirlwind tour of the Arab world. Well, let's start with the Maghreb, with Morocco, uh, normalization and Israeli embassy, direct flights Tel Aviv, Casablanca soon. Um, uh, even in the sub in the Sahara area, uh, non-Arab countries, but Muslim countries like Chad and Mali, and soon probably also Niger, will have uh, uh, relations with Israel. Egypt is a full-fledged uh, uh, peace treaty. In the Gulf, we know what happens in the Gulf. Uh, and we have, with some of them, the Emirates and Bahrain, uh, uh, former relations. The UAE even already nominated their first ambassador. Our first ambassador is already in Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, Bahrain, and we know that others, um, even if it's still informal, uh, we have flourishing, thriving uh, relations. Then we go to Jordan, a full-fledged peace treaty. So basically, the, the, the only two Arab states with which 
we still have a conflict are Syria and Lebanon. But you have to uh, uh, understand the conflict with the conflict with Syria and Lebanon, which is a dangerous one. I'm not uh, uh, underestimating its importance. The conflict with Syria and Lebanon is not with the Arab states, Syria and Lebanon, is with the Iranian presence in Syria and Lebanon. The Iranian attempt to entrench itself in Syrian territory to open a, a, another front, a direct front with Israel in the Golan Heights. And Lebanon is with Hezbollah, which for every practical purpose is a puppet, is a, is a proxy of Iran. So uh, it reminds me that, uh, uh, you know, history sometimes have its weird twists. Uh, uh, the, the, the Israeli uh, security doctrine um, that uh, was devised by our first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, basically said back in the 50s, in the early 50s, that since Israel has a conflict with the Arab world, with the Arab states, we have to forge alliances with the non-Arab players in the Middle East. Who are the non-Arab players in the Middle East? Ben-Gurion uh, uh, um, detected mainly three, Iran, Turkey, and Ethiopia. Uh, putting Ethiopia aside, the, co the situation now has completely reversed, 180 degrees. Since we have a conflict with the non-Arab players in the Middle East, mainly Iran, but also to a large uh, uh, extent, to a large degree also Turkey, Israel forges alliances with its Arab, with the Arab players in the Middle East, uh, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, Morocco, etc., etc. That is a revolutionary change in the Middle East that uh, 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 the, the words of Secretary Kerry that were spoken just uh, five years ago in, 20, uh, in 2016, even less, I think it was December 2016. Um, I mean, it's the sound now really so absurd and uh, it's not the only absurd thing that uh, 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 Secretary Kelly said. Now, let's say a few words about the future of our region, region after the Abraham Accords and after the uh, inauguration of the Biden administration. I think that one of the most um, underestimated issues, but in my view is, uh, has extreme importance, is uh, to watch, to monitor very carefully uh, the relations between the Biden administration, the US under the Biden administration, and Saudi Arabia. Um, that will be a litmus test. Um, the uh, Biden, the Democrats, the Biden administration dislikes Saudi Arabia. They dislike it because of the human rights record, they dislike it because of the um, war in Yemen, and they dislike it because uh, that unfortunate event that happened in their consulate in, in Istanbul. Um, but uh, Saudi Arabia is vital if uh, uh, the US wants to form a coalition, a diplomatic coalition, or for sure a military, but even if it's a diplomatic coalition to contain uh, uh, Iran. So um, I hope that uh, uh, the, the US dis overcomes um, that dislike of Saudi Arabia. I think that Israel has to be active in, in, in bridging that uh, 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 gap uh, because uh, Saudi Arabia is vital to form a, a, a coalition that will as I said, contain the malicious designs of the Islamic Republic. Um, regarding uh, uh, the so-called peace process, I would like to say uh, this observation. Um, consecutive American administrations, uh, excluding the, the last one, uh, had this, uh, um, I would say, this strategy or tactic or, or, or uh, um, they would, a new president was inaugurated, a new secretary of state installed, and then they would take us on one hand, the Palestinians on the other hand, immediately, months, weeks after the inauguration, they will run with us and jump together with us 
with us into the swimming pool of the peace process. There was only one problem. They never checked if there is any water in that swimming pool. And usually the re end result was that all three of us, Israel, Palestinians, and the American administration, the American president, uh, cracked our skulls. Um, I hope that uh, uh, the Biden administration uh, continues uh, with this, uh, uh, adapts the same um, um, tactic that the Trump administration did, not brush, talk to everyone, understand the situation. President Biden must understand that the Middle East of 2021 is completely different to the Middle East that he knew during his days as a uh, of the Foreign uh, Relations Committee in the Senate, and even of, uh, as, as, as the Vice President of Barack Obama. We have now uh, an ailing, uh, a useless uh, uh, Palestinian um, uh, leadership. We have the Abraham Accords. Uh, we have an, Israeli, an Israel that is uh, uh, really thriving in an economy and military might. Um, and uh, uh, the situation is completely different. And I hope, really, I, I sincerely hope that the, uh, President Biden, uh, Senate, uh, Secretary Blinken, understand that we are in a completely different game. And the tactics of the past of courting the Palestinians and pressuring Israel are exactly what is not needed these days. What is needed these days, we continue uh, uh, the momentum of the Abraham Accords uh, in order to bring uh, stability and eventually also peace uh, to the Middle East. I uh, will conclude saying that uh, in that uh, sense, uh, we are very far. Uh, we made a long road, a long way since the days uh, in which uh, I used to come uh, uh, to Washington, uh, assisted by the ZOA as representative of the Yesha Council, uh, to meet uh, um, senators and members of Congress and other officials. Uh, we are in a very different uh, uh, place. Uh, Israel is a different place. The Middle East is in a different place. Judea and Samaria are in a different place. And uh, we look forward uh, with optimism uh, to continue. Um, uh, growing both uh, Israel as a country, um, Judea and Samaria as a region, and uh, uh, our relations with the Arab world at large uh, and the international arena uh, uh, even more uh, broadly in the coming years. Thank you so much uh, for having me in this uh, real, uh, really trailblazing event that you organize. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador Danny Dayan. That was very interesting and a good, uh, a good overview on what's going on in the Middle East in general and Israel's position in it. And uh, as was noted, Israel's position certainly changed. And beginning with last summer uh, and this year was characterized by a burst of warmth between the citizens uh, of Israel and the United Arab Emirates. It was so fast, hopeful and surprising. We have with us somebody from, from the other side, not just from our perspective, but Dr. Najat Al Said from the UAE is an academic researcher, a columnist at Al Atihad newspaper, Al Khura news channel, and now also an Israel Hayom newspaper. Her lecture topic is gonna keep me right at the edge of my seat, which is establishing a media alliance between the Abraham Accords countries to combat media polarization and distortion. So take it away, Dr. Najad, and thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, everybody. Today, my topic is, is gonna be about establishing media alliance between the Abraham Accord countries to combat media polarization. So before I talk about media alliance, let us talk about the core problem of the polarization. What is the problem? We can see the, the main problem is basically driven out of the global mainstream media dominated by the, the ones in the United States and the United Kingdom, which is full of disinformation, bias, and polarization. We can see also both Israel and Arab uh, Gulf countries mainly as UAE and Bahrain are faced with a great deal of attacks and disinformation. 
but each part has different kind of attacks. For example, in the Arab Gulf countries like UAE and Bahrain, they are faced with attacks that is over exaggeration of human rights without taking into consideration the other, other main problems. Like for example, the, those who take advantage of human rights as political Islamists for their own political agenda. And they're using the human rights that are, that are supported by Western countries to, 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 to pressure these countries at the same time to fulfill their own power. This type of, uh, of usage and exploitation by the, those political Islamists are not quietly understood by the Western media, the, which is the, the liberal media, and, and that what is causing the, the kind of bias and disinformation. The attack on, on Israel, on the other hand, is quite different. The, the focus is basically showing one type of attack and not showing the, uh, the other. For example, is showing the attack of the Israelis on the on uh, parties like for, like Hamas, for example, without showing that Hamas has hit uh, the the uh, the civilians in Israel. Here, the image is is basically showing Israel as the attacker and the aggressor. So, in this terms, both Arab Gulf countries and uh, and Israel are facing this kind of distortion of image among the public by the traditional media. So what, what, what should be done in terms of this kind of, uh, of bias and uh, disinformation? For instance, the foreign policy of the Obama administration was very different from the, the Trump administration. The Trump administration was opposed to, to the Iranian nuclear deal agreed by the Obama administration and opposes the Iranian interference in the Arab countries the Trump uh, administration was uh, also opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood and has, uh, and has considered it and designated as a terrorist organ organization. While the, the Obama administration was supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, especially in what is called the Arab Spring. Now, the Biden administration is basically another kind of version of the Obama administration and the, trying to do almost the same thing, uh, uh, the same thing and to trying to undo all what has been done in the Trump administration. So here comes the confusion and here comes the inconsistency between one administration and the other uh, administration, between the Democrat and the Republican. And all of that is on the expense of the region. So and instead of continuing what has been done by the Trump administration, and we see more peace deals, we went back to box number one, which is going back to the Iranian nuclear deal, and also going back to the same type of strategy to solve the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, which is basically taking the agreement of the Palestinian Authority, which basically going to the unsolved mystery. So we see all of those political differences are reflected in the media. So the, the Democrat Party is reflected by the liberal uh, mainstream media because the, lame, the, the, the mainstream media is basically dom dominated by the views of the liberal Democrats. So all the views of the Democrats are reflected in the liberal mainstream media, while the, the views of the, of the conservative party or the Republican party is basically reflected in the, in, the, uh, in the conservative media. And that might explain why Arab Gulf countries, for example, UAE or Bahrain are more allied to the conservative media, while the, uh, the pro -is political Islam or the anti-Semitic are, are much more pro to the mainstream media. And here comes what is called the polarization. One group goes to one side and another, go, and another group goes to another. So how we can face this kind of polarization? What is the solution of this polarization? One of the main tools that was used to, to combat this bias in the, and polarization in the mainstream media is the, through using digital diplomacy. What is, the, what is the digital diplomacy? Digital diplomacy is the use of information, technology, communication, and social media to uh, practice public diplomacy activities and, uh, and, uh, and the tasks. What, ha what has changed here is not only the medium, it's only the medium, not the message. So the message is still the same 
but the medium it's changed. So instead of using the medium of the traditional media, like using the radio or the television, now, now the digital diplomacy or diplomats now are using social networks, so for example, Twitter, Facebook and others. So uh, that's why we see now uh, both Arab foreign countries uh, or, or Arab foreign ministries and Israel foreign ministries a ministry are using the digital diplomacy. Regarding the Arab part, the main, the main uh, part or the main uh, reason for using it and when exactly the digital diplomacy was used intensively was basically after what is called the Arab Spring. The, those Arab countries found that, uh, that the Arab Spring was basically inf inflamed by using the social media and mainly like Twitter and Facebook and also WhatsApp. So they use uh, the, the youth use all of these kind of tools to organize the protest. And those, those, those protests were not, unfortunately, were not spontaneous or were not direct from the youth. They were exploited by opportunist groups like the political Islamists uh, that use the, the anger of the youth to, for, to fulfill their own political agenda. And those political Islamists were actually influenced by external uh, parties and external influencers. So, and, and that what made the Arab foreign ministries to take really a, a, a important consideration of the importance of digital diplomacy. The Israeli foreign ministry, uh, ministry were using digital diplomacy for different reasons. The main reason of using digital diplomacy mainly to get closer to countries that are either hostile or have no diplomatic relations. So in order to get closer to them and to the public opinion, they, want to, they used the digital diplomacy. So one of the main comments that was said by the was said actually by the director of Israel Digital Diplomacy Unit, uh, Yuram Murad, that he said that digital diplomacy enabled to uh, to uh, to be enabled to be less dependent on traditional gatekeeper gatekeepers as newspapers uh, editors in terms of getting their message across. For instance. You can have a very successful viral campaign without bothering with getting through the gate, the traditional gatekeeper, uh, gatekeepers, because if it is successful online, the gatekeeper in traditional media will write about it. A big campaign gets a lot of press, which may influence public opinion, and then you you center the sphere of the of the policy and decision makers who are always attend to public opinion. So what what he's trying to say here, and instead of the traditional media or the traditional gatekeepers that uh, that are in in control of the information, now those who are using the digital diplomacy and the online are are, are in control of this information. And if it is if it gets successful the traditional gatekeepers will be taking the information from the digital media or the digital diplomacy for, and they get the information and spread it. And here, here you have like less dependence on the traditional media and the traditional gatekeepers, which is a very important point. So with all the advantages of digital diplomacy, studies show that digital diplomacy by itself is insufficient. And, combat and combating the polarization and bias of the mainstream media. So what should be done? The, uh, there are several suggestions here um, the, that, uh, that can help in combating the bias and misinformation of the mainstream media. One of those uh, suggestions are uh, establishing joint media venture as a joint satellite news channel that includes, uh, for example, both Emiratis and Israelis to better, for better dialogue and mutual understanding among people. Such channel would definitely require sophisticated management and carefully calculated investment. Another suggestion could be to combat this kind of misinformation and bias is launching a joint YouTube channel that, uh, that explore the hypocrisy of radical political Islamism as uh, advocates regimes to political Islam and groups as the Muslim Brotherhood. For instance, showing the differences between what they say in Arabic media compared to what they say in the English media, 
uh, so mostly what they say in the in the English media is basically talking about uh, tolerance and pluralism, while when we see them in the Arabic media, they're elevating violence and anti-Semitism. So all of these things should be shown in the this kind of YouTube channel, a joint YouTube channel. Also, since the usage of social media, especially among the youth, is high, it is worth to emphasize on the social media to balance out the bias in the traditional media. Also, we saw how social media has played a huge role in building warm peace uh, due to its interactivity and engagement among people and across civil society. As a result of that, and, and something that is called uh, citizen diplomacy, which is basically kind of digital diplomacy, but among the ordinary, not among the diplomats only. So at this stage, it is important not only to qualify diplomats for communication diplomacy or, the, or communication uh, technology, but also national professional, professionals, uh, the, the national professionals the skills of these active users that are using certain social networks as those active users on Twitter or Facebook or any kind of social network that is so uh, active and popular among the youth, we can train them and, uh, and to use the, the activity of those younger, younger professionals and use their skills to, uh, to basically influence the, the region and the, inter, and the international public opinion through, uh, through meaningful engagement. This is another kind of usage of the of effective usage of the social media. Regardless of all of those tools, what will make this media alliance successful is basically all of those Abraham Accord countries are driven by pragmatism, not ideologism. They are driven by prosperity and development for their, for their people, not by ideology. And that will make this Abraham Accord successful and will make, and will make this media alliance successful. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Najah. Just a year ago, uh, really not so long ago, it was considered a dream to see a person like you participate in such an event uh, that we have lived and came to this time, we say Shekhyan Vikimano Lazman Azeh. Dr. Najad will stay with us for questions at the end of the session. And I just wanna add one more point, which is I personally have felt uh, what she talked about digital diplomacy, just on Twitter, connecting to so many Emiratis, uh, Omanis, Bahrainis, uh, just talking with them and actually took a page out of uh, Asher Fredman, who we're gonna hear from later, just to see the pictures, share the life on, this, on the social media, really break down borders through it. So the Abraham Accords was, was really happening on Twitter uh, as well. Uh, I'm very honored to, uh, to bring Dr. Mordechai Kedar uh, to, the, uh, to our forum today. He's, of course, a very well-known expert on Islam in the Arab world. Uh, Dr. Mordechai Kedar is a research associate at the Besa Center for Strategic Studies at Bar Ilan, and he served for 25 years as the lieutenant colonel uh, in the Israeli military intelligence. He still serves in reserves in Northern and Central Command. He's done hundreds of interviews in the Arab media where he presents the state of Israel and defends it from prejudice and hatred. He does it in beautiful Arabic. You know, he just makes them sit up and listen and, and he's amazing like that. Uh, he's also one of my personal mentors and I am very proud to invite Dr. Kedar to talk about changes in the Arab world in recent years. Dr. Mordechai Kedar. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for having me in this highly important uh, conference. I would like to speak about the failure of the Palestinian narrative, which enabled the Abraham Accord to go forward. Um, and this, the failure of the Palestinian narrative has several reasons. First of all, uh, we are uh, like 72 years after the 1948 uh, problem, what happened here. And uh, with the time which passes, uh, the memory of 1948 is fading. Second reason is that the Arab Spring, which started like a decade ago, uh, has caused countries and publics in the Arab world to uh, concentrate on their own problems because their problems are very big. Look at Syria, 
We had like a million people get, getting killed. Uh, Iraq is dysfunctional. Libya is in a swamp of, uh, of uh, blood and tears. Uh, Yemen is in a constant war. So what is the Palestinian issue already? So the Arab Spring definitely, or what happened uh, in the Arab Spring, definitely oversheds the Palestinian issue. The third problem is the Palestinian split between Hamas and Fatah actually paralyzes all progress. And the Arabs are sick and tired from hearing them blaming each other for this paralysis of the Palestinian uh, 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 act. And they actually tell them, get, get your act together uh, before you ask our support. And as long as you cannot uh, sit with each other, leave us alone. Uh, the fourth reason is that the relationship between Hamas and Iran, which uh, aggravates many people in, in like in Saudi Arabia, in the Emirates, uh, because they, they feel the Iranian threat uh, just behind their neck. And, uh, and the Palestinians are, you know, especially Hamas, are uh, with the Iranians in the same bed. And they, everybody remembers that Arafat, the PLO, actually supported Saddam Hussein when he invaded uh, uh, Kuwait in 1990 and they threatened uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. So, so both Hamas and, 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 uh, and the Fatah actually are sympathizing with the enemies of these countries. Uh, the fifth reason is that the, relation, the, the revelations about the sale of land uh, to Jews uh, by the Palestinians, and this already started 100 years ago and even more, and especially the case of Jamal Rayyan, the, the, the mastermind of Al Jazeera, uh, who keeps calling upon the Arabs to come and liberate Palestine, while his father was a, a land leader and sold large parts of, uh, of the Sharon area uh, uh, to Jews. So, excuse me, your father sold, gun, sold the land to the Jews and you want us to come and liberate uh, Palestine? Forget it. Okay, so this is an, another reason which uh, was revealed uh, during the last uh, couple of years. Uh, another reason is the refusal of the uh, century uh, uh, plan or the this the deal of the century by the uh, Palestinians, including the grants of billions which they were supposed to get from this. So if they refuse any problem, any any solution with the Israelis, so what do you expect that they will support uh, that we the Arab countries can support you forever? Uh, another thing is the corruption and the theft of money uh, in the PA. And, 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 and Arabs are very angry about this. Uh, the, eighth reasons is, the eighth reason is that the PLO and the PA are uh, too busy with salaries, pensions, appointings of uh, boys and girls, of, the, uh, of the, the sons and daughters of the officials to the positions. And uh, it's some kind of uh, corruption which uh, and nobody really wants to support. Um, and there's a result of all these, that the men in the street uh, sees the PA is responsible for the economic crisis in general of the PA and what happened in the coronavirus time uh, is much, much worse. That the PA is viewed as the um, main uh, cause for the economic problem. Uh, if it's correct or not, this doesn't really make any difference. The P, as long as the people see the, P, the, the PA as the responsible, so it is the responsible. Um, and, and, and the majority of the public today thinks that it is better for them to stay connected to Israel, you know, if, even within the Palestinians, than uh, to establish a state uh, which can become another Hamastan. Uh, as happened in January in 2006 when Hamas won the majority of the seats of the Legislative Council. Uh, uh, or uh, everybody remembers what happened in Gaza in June 2007 when Hamas took over. So it can happen again in, in, uh, in the West Bank or Judea and Samaria. 
So why establish a state which might become another Hamastan? Um, another reason which uh, for Westerners, it's hard to, to understand. The PA and Hamas are focusing constantly on the Al-Aqsa problem, which is a religious issue, uh, which became the central issue for the whole Islamic world on the expense of Mecca and Medina. Uh, this is the, the central uh, uh, cities of, of Islam. Recently, the Saudis are starting to talk about the fact that the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which appears in the Quran, was actually near Mecca, not in Jerusalem. So they are actually pulling the rag under the feet of the Palestinian religious argument. And this is very significant when it comes to Islamic societies. Uh, and on the other hand, Israel is portrayed as a story of success, unlike the Palestinian issue uh, in all the areas. And the Palestinian story actually interferes with connecting with Israel. And this is when they now have to to take a side between Israel and the Palestinian issue, definitely uh, it is easier for them to, to stand with Israel or to side with Israel when the Palestinian issue became such a burden on them. Thank you so much. All right, Professor Kedar, thank you so much. Uh, excellent as usual. The only problem with uh, Dr. Kedar is that you have to uh, go back and watch again what he said because he says so much in such a short amount of time. I will myself be reviewing what, what he said. Um, and so also with, uh, with uh, Dr. Najat as well. Fascinating stuff. Now the Abraham, that, that's all serious stuff, but uh, there's, there's a real fun side to the Abraham Accords, which opened up an economic opportunity that has been closed up until now. So Asher Fredman is a fellow at the Kohelet Policy Forum. He holds a BA and MA from Harvard University in Government and Middle East Studies. And before he came to Kohelet, he served as Chief of Staff um, and International Affairs Advisor at Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs and Public Security. Now he's the founding member of the UAE Israel Business Council and is the CEO of Gulf Israel Green Ventures. Uh, I can tell you that he, he did a great job and he's going to show you some wonderful pictures uh, from his escapades uh, in the UAE. But my favorite, and I hope he shows it, was when Asher was driving down a big, beautiful highway in a convertible, like some kind of Miami Vice guy, uh, <laughs> down, down in, in the UAE in Dubai. And it just he made it look so amazing and so open. And he did it all with a big keeper on his head. Asher Fredman, thanks so much for joining us. Go ahead. Thank you, and I'm glad that I get to be the fun part. Um, I think the other lectures were quite fun as well, but thank you, Yishai. Thank you to the ZOE, to the ZOA, to the Yesha Council, to My Israel, to the Shiloh Policy Forum, of course. Thank you for organizing this amazing event and for having me speak. And as Yishai mentioned, in addition to being a fellow at the Kohelet Policy Forum, I founded the Israel Emirati Forum, which is the largest active community of Israelis, Emiratis, and Bahrainis. I'm a founding member of the UAE Israel Business Council, which is the largest business council bridging between the two countries. And I'm the founder as well of Gulf Israel Green Ventures, which works to bring together Emirati and Israeli green technologies, entrepreneurs, and businesses. So I want to begin with a story. Dubai, October 2020, I walk into a business center and all of a sudden a very distinguished looking uh, Emirati gentleman approaches me and he says, welcome, so nice to see you. I was a little taken aback, I don't know him. He said, thank you, thank you. But I didn't, wasn't quite sure what was going on and he walked away. After a minute, I realized that it was because I was wearing a kippah on my head and he was excited, he assumed that kippah means Israeli. And he was very excited to welcome an Israeli to the UAE. Comes back a couple of minutes later and says, oh, I apologize, I had to go pray in the prayer room, um, but I'm sitting here at the restaurant next door with my Italian Christian friend, won't you come join us? So I agree and I go sit down with him in Emirati Muslim, Italian Christian and Israeli Jew sitting in a restaurant. It sounds like the beginning of a joke. And also as I'm there, I Google his name. I realize, I realize that he's a former minister in the government, a very prominent member of one of the leading families in Dubai. Then he says to me, well, it's Thursday evening. 
Thursday evening, we go out to my majlis in the desert. The majlis, as you can see in the pictures here, is a kind of reception hall where people get together and socialize. That's really where decisions get made. Why don't you come and join us? So throwing a bit of caution to the wind, I go along and it's beautiful. We drive out to the desert. We meet kids who are falconing with their falcons and they're so excited because it's the first time they've ever met a Jew. So they ask to take pictures with me. We see camels walking across the desert back home. And then we go to the mattress, a beautiful building with rugs on the floors. I take off my shoes because we're entering into this, into this room. And we're sitting there, we're talking with him and his friends. We're talking about Israel and the UAE and Islam and Judaism. They have lots of questions about Jerusalem and about Tel Aviv. And we notice that late evening is becoming later and later and the sun is setting, which means that it's time to pray. So I get up to pray Mincha, they get up to pray their magra pairs, I put on my shoes, they take off their sandals, I stand up, they kneel down. We're both facing pretty much the same direction because if you're in Dubai, both Jerusalem and Mecca are more or less in the same direction. And we begin our prayers. And there's this beautiful moment of quiet where all of us, the children of Abraham, are united in our prayers as the sun is setting over the desert in Dubai. And why do I tell you this story? On the one hand, it has nothing to do with business. On the other hand, it has everything to do with business. And I'll get to that in just a moment. I absolutely believe that there is not only tremendous business potential between the UAE and Israel, but that business and the private sector can play a tremendous role in building the warm people to people peace that we all seek, that we've all been missing in our other peace agreements. Business can fulfill this role if it's done in the right way and if it's done in the smart way. Unfortunately, it's not always been done that way. So what I'd like to do now is to go through the ABCs of how to do business in the Emirates. A, align goals. B, build relationships. C, co-create. I'm actually gonna begin with B, building relationships. That evening I spent out of the majlis has actually led to some interesting business directions and business, business opportunities with follow-up conversations and follow-up meetings, et cetera. But that certainly wasn't the goal in my going out there. It was a surprise. I didn't plan to be out there that evening. But it underscores an important point that in the UAE, before you talk about business, before you build a business relationship, you first have to build a personal relationship. The trust, the mutual understanding, once you get to know each other, once you understand that you're two people that would like to that trust each other and would like to do business together, then you can talk about business. It's a little bit different. Sometimes in Israel or in the States as well, we tend to be very transactional, right? We want to know how much, how fast, when can it ship, how much are you going to invest? Yes, no, 10 minutes, let's move forward. Let's get this done. In the UAE, it's a different, it's a different kind of culture. And it's very, very important to first build that trust and that personal relationship before you work on to the business opportunities and the business relationship. A, aligning goals. One of the interesting things about Emiratis is that they have a very entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit, but it's a little bit different than the spirit that we're used to here in Israel. What I've discovered is that many Emiratis, including people who have senior positions in big multinational companies, big diversified family businesses, important government entities, also have a side startup, a side business. And very often that entrepreneurship, that startup, it's a business, it's probably based on a business model, but its main goal isn't to make money. Its main goal is to help realize the vision of the Emirati leadership in making the UAE not only a leading country in the Middle East, but one of the leading countries in the world. The Emirati leadership has put to, has put forward an incredible vision and created an incredible culture and ethos within the country of wanting to turn the UAE into a world leader in numerous areas that are of great importance to the world community today, whether it's in education or innovation or science or space or health or sustainability. And the vast majority of Emiratis are deeply appreciative of the way that the leadership has not only developed the, the economy of the country, but has developed the human and social capital of the country and see it as their role and their duty and their privilege to give back, to help further the development of the country and to realize the vision of the leadership. This vision 
In some cases, it's contained in documents like the uh, UAE Centennial 2071, UAE Vision 2021. In other cases, it's clear from government policy and government incentives. Very often, the economy follows the government rather than the other way around. And so it's very important for an Israeli entrepreneur, an Israeli business interested in entering the UAE to think about, to first study and understand what are the priorities of the Emirati leadership and of the Emirati eco economy in consequence, and how can what he or she is offering meet, meet those priorities, further those goals, and to position yourself as, as an entity that will help further realize that vision. C, co-create. And this is something that is probably the least known. What I've seen is very often Israelis who come to the UAE, they're looking for one of two things. One is investments, investments for their startup, for their real estate project. And the second is to bring cutting edge Israeli technology to the UAE. In terms of investments, I personally think that it's not the right way to go. The VC culture there is quite different. It's insofar as it exists, mostly focused on the local scene. The big sovereigns are a different story. I don't wanna get into that right now. I do think there's absolutely a opportunity and a market for bringing cutting edge Israeli technology into the UAE in all different fields, whether it's medical or cyber or agro or water or AI or sustainability. But what the Emiratis are really looking for is not only to be, or no longer to be consumers of the world's best technology, but to be producers of the world's best technology. The world's best technology to have written on it made in the UAE. And therefore, like I said, there is an opportunity certainly for bringing Israeli technologies into the UAE. But the next level, the stage that we should be aiming for, if we really want to bring it to the next level, is how do we co-create? How do we create joint ventures and initiatives, joint development by entrepreneurs, perhaps developed in one area and scaled in the other country, joint R&D, joint research, funds that invest, that use their investments to bring together entrepreneurs, innovators, leaders from both countries. So that ultimately what is created is created as a joint project, as a joint venture between Israelis and between Emiratis. That's the way to take it to the next level. Now, as I said, business can certainly be an important bridge to peace. Now, anybody who's in the UAE can see very quickly the incredible culture of tolerance and diversity and moderation and multiculturalism which has been created in the UAE. You walk around the street, the mall, you see people from 160 different countries living together, working together in peace. Now, as an Israeli Jew wearing my kippah, this led to some very interesting interactions. I remember one of my first days, I was in the elevator going down and somebody turns around to me in the elevator and says, hey, are you from Israel? I'm from Oman. And I have to admit, for a second there, I tense stop. They said, it's so nice to see you here. Later that day, I was in a cafe with an Emirati friend and an Arab gentleman walks up to us and he says, I see the Israelis are here. When will, we, they, when will we see them in our country? I said to him, where are you from? He said, Lebanon. And other meetings, I had other meetings um, and other interactions and conversations with people from uh, Jordan, from the West Bank, from Judea and Samaria, apologies, um, from, Syria, from Syria, from even from Iran. And all these conversations taking place within um, the milieu of, of the UAE were all respectful based on desire to gain deeper mutual understanding. And I think that through this Israeli Emirati peace, we can, we can develop the relationships, develop the mutual understanding that we can then hopefully take back to our, our home countries. So in conclusion, I think that business has tremendous potential for being a bridge to peace. If we remember the ABCs, aligning goals, building relationships, co-creating, we can create a war people to people to peace between Israel and the UAE and between Israel and the wider Middle East. Thank you very much. Okay, fabulous uh, talk, Asher, thank you very much. And Asher is gonna stay with us for questions and answers later. Uh, I just want to comment that uh, the Abraham Accords is famous for being between Israel and, and Morocco and the UAE and Bahrain, Oman. Th those, those are great achievements. We're trying to do the same thing in Judea and Samaria, especially in a town like Hebron. We've got a dream that we would have a joint hotel, a hotel that would be an Arab Jewish hotel, an Ibrahimi hotel, 
or Father Abraham Hotel or the uh, uh, Ohel Avraham, the tent of Abraham. There'll be a, a kind of shared hotel built by joint money and bring all the tourists that people want to come and, and really connect to the founder of the Abraham Accords, Abraham, right? The original, uh, the original person who, who, who brought us all together, the children of Abraham. So we're looking forward to those opportunities developing the Abraham Accords, even in Judea and Samaria. And speaking of Judea and Samaria, uh, the dramatic changes that we've been hearing about uh, also brought along with it fascinating stories. One of them is by Vered Ben Saadon. She's the owner of Tura Winery in the town of Rechelim in Samaria. Vered and her, and her husband Erez were amongst the first wine growers uh, that went to those mountains and, and, and planted in Samaria. They planted and grew dozens of dunams of vineyards in Har Bracha in Samaria. Now, a few months ago, Vered signed an oil and wine export agreement and other products from Judea and Samaria with large commercial companies in the United Arab Emirates. So she, she is sending it out there and she is going to join us right now. Vered, thank you so much for joining us for a few minutes to tell us uh, about your winery, about the deal, and also maybe to have Lachaim with us. Vered, take it away. Thank you for the opportunity. Shalom, everybody. I'm Vered Ben Sadon from the Tour Winery and the uh, wife of Erez, and we're living in Rechelim. Rechelim is a small community two minutes from the city Ariel. We married, say, 25 years ago, 26 actually, and we lived on Mount Grizim. We were a young couple uh, with no knowledge. We want only to settle the land and we began to plant vineyards. After four years, we began to sell the grapes to a big winery in the country, and they produce high quality of wine. But unfortunately, because of politics, that winery decided not to buy any more grapes from us, and we got a real big problem. We were thinking what to do, and we decided to open a winery. And in Austria, we opened a tour winery here in Rechelim with 1,200 bottles only. Today, we are producing 100,000 bottles a year, 40% were export to the States, Canada, Europe. And like uh, you said, also a few, like two months ago, also I have been in Dubai, in the Emirates, and it was a big opportunity. I can tell you that it was like a dream because when I went there, my daughter, she's eight, she was asking, mommy, is it, is it not very dangerous to go there? They will not throw stones on you because that's, some of the times the situation here in Samaria. And I said, no, it's a, a new opportunity for us and we trust the people and I will go there and we will see and feel what it will be. And I can tell you that I was alone in the first day and I was a little bit afraid, but very, very fast it changed because people uh, really uh, behave to me like a family. They host me in their own uh, houses. Uh, they serve kosher food. And I knew also then that it is a really very important moment for me as a person and also for uh, the Samaria, the people in Samaria, the product of Samaria and the people in Israel. Because it's, it's something that I cannot imagine years ago. And I felt so at home and people were so excited about it. And when I sat with people, really very old people, like 70, 80 years old, that we began to talk a little bit about politics and they said, it's not relevant. What's relevant is that we will broke the ice between the people and we have an opportunity to, to do something new and, and actually do, do a, make, produce by, all, by our self a piece of the history. And that's something that I appreciate very much. And, Let's say that a month ago we sent the olive oil. It's supposed to get there this week. Uh, the one we already sent, and there was already a very big wedding with our, the two wines uh, in Dubai. And we know that, like Asher said, it's very important to build the relations uh, before uh, the business. And we we are in contact really uh, every week. And I supposed to be there again. But now with the lockdown Israel, it's really not so easy. But I hope in March I can go there again and to uh, continue the business and the good relationship between us and the people there. Thank you. Okay, Vered, thank you so much. And you still owe us a l'chaim. Uh, so we hope that you uh, 
You take L'chaim. out your, that's right. That's right. L'chaim. We want to see the actual L'chaim. We want to see that wine. We want to see it being real. And uh, is, if anybody has seen pictures of, um, of Israeli products displayed in UAE supermarkets, they, you know, with the Israeli flag, it's really something uh, quite remarkable and beautiful. And uh, I think that Asher Fredman told us before that business brings peace, but also peace brings business. That's also a good thing. So uh, Verity is going to stick with us uh, for questions, as, as, as well as many of the other panelists. And so I'm now going to hand over the mic and move on to Danny Luz, who's the ZOA operations manager in Israel, uh, in order to uh, take your questions from the participants and, and, and navigate the answers. So Danny Luz, take it away. Are you there? Thank you very much, Ishai, and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I think everyone agrees that this was really uh, fascinating. Uh, we have three speakers that are staying with us. We have Najat Al Said, Asher Friedman, and Vered Ben Saadon, and we've heard of all of them. Uh, what I'll do is first ask one different question to each of you, uh, and afterwards I'll ask one uh, question that I'd like all of you to answer. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. We've already passed the hour, so try to keep your answers short. Uh, but since this is so amazing, I can tell you that there were over 240 people here and that most people stayed up until now. Uh, this was a very fascinating uh, talk, and I'm sure that your answers will also be fascinating. Uh, the first question is for Najat, uh, and it's from Kevin John Williams, who asked it in the chat. Uh, he said, great talk, uh, Dr. Al Said. Uh, reliance on social media means uh, vulnerability to censorship by the big tech companies who own those platforms. Uh, any ideas on this problem? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity for this speech. And I'm so grateful that he asked this question. It's a very important question. And definitely it came up uh, to my mind, especially after the, uh, the censorship of um, Trump himself, the former president and his uh, supporters. Yes, this is very important. So when I talked, uh, that's why I talked about social media in general. I just gave example on Twitter and Facebook, but um, that means that's why the alliance with, uh, among the Abraham Accord countries are, uh, is so important because they need to have their own platform, social media platform to get things done. They couldn't just depend on big t uh, companies like Facebook and Twitter. And then after that, they become hostage. Uh, we become hostage under, uh, under their requirements and their authority. And we saw what happened. But, uh, and, and that's why we, uh, you know, together we can make it. Like look, you, we saw what happened to Parter. You know, if you work by yourself, you're gonna be attacked. But if you are like a couple of countries together working to design a strong uh, social media platform, we can do it all together and we need it. So that's why I, I focus on digital diplomacy and citizen diplomacy, both, and how it is good to overcome and combat this, uh, this kind of polarization in the mainstream media. Thank you so much, Dr. Al Said. Uh, the next question is for Asher. I'll tell both Asher and Vera that there's a lot of people on the chat that want to know about your organizations and your winery. So afterwards, I, I suggest that you share links about your organizations and wineries uh, in the chat for everyone uh, to get it. Uh, maybe you can say uh, the name of your organization and your wineries again when you answer the question. But the specific question is a more personal question for you. Uh, what brought you to deal with UAE-Israel relations? Is it more of the business opportunity or ideology, seeing that there's peace coming right now and you wanted to take part in that? No, I, in the years, I spent nine years in the Israeli government, in the prime minister's office and in the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. And we talked frequently in our meetings, especially when I was working with Minister Erdan, now Ambassador Erdan, about the need to this top-down political process that John Kerry way was just wrong, and it was never going to work. And what we really needed to do was build a people-to-people -people peace. And when the Abraham Accords were announced in August, I said, wow, now we have an opportunity to actually make it happen, to actually show ourselves and the world that the way to build a real peace is not top down, it's not demanding concessions, it's bottom up, it's people to people. And, and, and I, I tweeted, I, the first good use I ever found was Twitter. I tweeted out, I wanna start a group of Israeli and Emiratis, who wants to join me? And the response was overwhelming. From there, the, so the 
beginning was certainly ideological. And from there, it developed also into the business opportunities, both because of the business sake, but also in the area that I want to focus on sustainability. I believe that the narrative, the idea of Israelis and Emiratis working together for the future of our countries, of our region, of the planet, is a wonderful story on a super important topic. And so it really combines the ideology and the business aspects. And I'll just say the two organizations that I mentioned, one is Gulf Israel Green Ventures, and one is the UAE Israel Business Council. And I'll put links to both in the chat. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Asher. Uh, and now Vered, I have to say that Vered's winery is one of my favorite wineries personally. And if you buy wines from there, you should try the rosé. It's an incredible wine. It's almost uh, out of stock. It's almost out of stock. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I got to taste it before it was on the market the last time I visited the winery. Uh, but uh, uh, the question, uh, it's echoing a question that we also got from Mindy about the effects of the Abraham Accords on the BDS uh, movement. Uh, and as, as a business that faced boycotts and that faced the BDS movement uh, before, do you feel that the Abraham Accords uh, bring you a, a new situation where you can uh, more easily fight the cause for boycott? Look, the BDS is a movement that um, is exist, but it's more noisy than it really works, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, the BDS is, for my opinion, by Davka or demonstratively Samaria. By Davka Shomron, by demonstratively Shomron, or Basiata Dishmaya. Because that's how I look about it. But uh, when I was there, I saw that all the conflict is not relevant anymore because these big countries, very rich countries, say very loudly, we want to do business, we want to have good relations, and that's the future about all the other you know, stories. Okay, but that's not relevant anymore. And uh, I, like I said, I, was, I felt really at home. They were so curious, they were so happy to meet the Israeli women, uh, Jewish women. I was curious as well. I want to speak with these women actually more, but there were not so many women outside, more men's. In the businesses, I saw only men's, um, maybe next time, uh, because that's part of have relationship to build it. Maybe the next time I can meet them as well. But I was really curious to meet the people, to speak, to see, eyes to eyes, people to people. And as it's also business, of course, we have a business tour winery. You can find us online, www.tourwinery.com. Also, we send uh, to the States 12 uh, bottles is free shipping. You can find them also online. And, and we are waiting to see you all in the winery here in Israel, hopefully soon. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll now ask one question that I'd like all of you to answer. Uh, we'll go in the same order. We'll start by Dr. Najat Al Said, afterwards Asher Friedman, and afterwards Vered uh, Ben Sadon. Uh, and the question is echoing a lot of questions that we had uh, in the chat. Uh, and that's the question. In a changing political climate, uh, with the changing Am uh, American administration and elections in Israel, uh, do you believe that the Abraham Accords will stand the test of time? Oh, can you uh, can you just repeat the last part? Can stand what? The test of time. In other words, that in the long term uh, they will survive, and that the political dynamics won't stop the developments that we've seen. Okay. Um, well, uh, my answer to this question is yes. I'm very optimistic that it will it will stand. For, uh, first of all, let me talk since I am here in UAE. Let me focus on UAE specifically. When UAE did that uh, peace treaty, uh, nobody forced it. It did it out of its own freedom. The second thing, you know, the UA did it uh, without any history of war. So it's not, uh, you know, no war uh, treaty. It is ba basically a peace treaty. And mainly the UAE is cons considering this Abraham Accord part of its development and moderni modernization uh, 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 model. It's not doing it only for the sake of doing it because part of the modernization and development mo model is to do this Abraham Accord because it knows, it knows it's gonna benefit. This is gonna be mutual interest. Israel is a very developed country in many fields, in, in medicine, in high tech, 
and uh, and uh, UAE is trying to build or actually building strong alliance with most of the all developed countries. And Israel is not far from that. It's one of the, those developed countries. So it's basically going to be mutual interest. The second thing, in my opinion, this is my opinion. The, you know, I don't believe in a peace uh, uh, should be coming after the two-state solution, what they call or any kind of uh, or any kind of solution. What you have to do, how you can do any kind of solution based on uh, on uh, uh, on the invisible thing. You have to know the the situation on ground, and then based on that, you make solutions. You know, for me, for example, as a researcher, how can I write or make a good uh, recommendations in my studies without going and seeing the people and seeing what is on ground. Then we make solutions. So normalization should be coming. Then ultimate solutions will be coming, not the other way around. This is what, how I see it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you really for taking the time to come today. And thank you for uh, all the incredible things you told us. Asher, uh, we'd love to hear your perspective. I just want to say that one of the amazing things about the Abraham Accords is getting to meet people like Dr. Najat. Um, it's just been such a, such a pleasure. I think it, I, agree, I agree with Dr. Najat. And because the UAE has this culture of openness and tolerance, and we get along with everybody, and we're a hub for everybody, certainly the peace with Israel and the, also the opening to the Jewish people, the Abraham House that's being developed now with a uh, synagogue, a church, and a mosque in Abu Dhabi, a major, major project all points in the direction of this being a core part of the Emirati ethos. I still think there will be, there may be bumps along the way. I mean, if we see in the post Abu, Abu Mazen era, a deterioration of the security situation in Judea and Samaria, a flare up in Gaza, a flare up in the Lebanese border, we may see bumps along the way. And therefore it's really in our hands. It's really in the hands of the people, the people piece, the business community, the cultural community, the student community to develop these relationships, these strong people the people bonds so that even when there is a geopolitical flare up, as they're sure they will be sooner or later, God willing not, but there likely will be, the bonds that exist today will allow the war and peace to continue despite those bumps. Thank you, Asher. Uh, and Vered, as someone who really visited there and made business, do you feel that the links that you built uh, can stand the test of time and the, the different political things that could happen? I, I agree that uh, I'm also very optimistic. I think it will stay. Uh, we are already uh, working on Bahrain, uh, to still went to Bahrain. And when I was there, I, I had a dream. If I could, I wish I could to take all the Muslims, all the Palestinians from Israel uh, on a trip to Dubai to see how it feels when people live in good conditions with people because they want it, because they choose it. And that was, that's my wish. Maybe one time they can come with us to see how it is, how it feels to, to have good life um, without fighting, only like Dr. Naja said, and to live good together. That, that's my dream. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you guys. Your lectures were really fascinating and your answers to the questions also. And now we're going back to Yishai Fleischer and Hebron uh, to close the event. All right, everybody, thank you so much to all the participants, to Yariv Levine, to Danny Dayan, to Dr. Najad Al Said, to Mordechai Kedar, to Asher Fredman, and to Vered Ben Saadon, and to Danny Luz as well, and all the folks that put this thing together uh, the Yesha Council, the Shiloh Forum, a ZOA, and a Ruth Sheva. I want to thank all the participants, and I hope that this meeting was what I thought it was, which is cutting edge uh, intellect, inte intellectual. Food, you know, something that we can understand what's really going on behind the scenes. And that's exactly what we're trying to provide for you here at these forums. So in two weeks time, we will be holding yet a fourth meeting, which will deal with the strategic and security aspects related to the Judea and Samaria area. You are invited to register now on the conference website. Uh, next week will be, of course, Purim, right? Uh, you know, we're already dressed up with all the face masks. So we're already ready for Purim. And we're going to have some of that Tura wine and, and really enjoy it. Uh, we wish everybody a happy holiday and, of course, victory of light over darkness and the end of the coronavirus pandemic and, and opening it up. And when that coronavirus pandemic indeed ends, 
it means that we'll be able to travel once again. So we, of course, invite you to the land of Israel. I invite you to that place that you can see behind me, which is the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs in Hebron. And that is where Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Leah uh, are buried, the founders of the Jewish people and the founders of the Abrahamic way. And I hope that when we start flying again, we're, we're not only going to have uh, an Abraham Accord, but we'll have an Abrahamic alliance, you know, like you have the Star Alliance, but we'll have an alliance with, you know, uh, with Etihad and Emirates and, and Kurdish Air and Egypt Air and El Al, and you'll be able to get points because it'll be part of some kind of Abrahamic alliance. And from business to something uh, even greater, which is an alliance of, of interests, of security, of prosperity, of tourism, of seeing these amazing sites and connecting to this amazing region. And we certainly hope that the Abraham Accords that you heard about so much today will also trickle down to a very local area here in Israel, in the so-called West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, in the heartland of the Jewish people, where there are so many Arabs that are living here. We also hope to see much more of that cooperation, uh, th that appreciation, that, that spirit uh, of connectivity under the banner of Abraham uh, happen in our, in, our, in our land, in our time. So I want to thank you very much again. I want to thank all the good people that have been watching and blessings to you from me, Shai Fleischer from Hebron, and in the name of the Yesha Council, that's the Council of Judea and Samaria, the Zionist Organization of America, that's ZOA, Shiloh Forum, My Israel, Yisrael Sheli, and Arut Sheva. Blessings to you from the land of Israel and Shalom.